the uh, the cohort of police that were trained by ISITAP in the past. Um, I know the answer to those questions, but I'm at a certain point I will um, read questions to either of the two of you um, and and let you answer them as you please. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Um, Um, I will probably um, use the first of the questions that I received from um, Erica Burnett um, when I, after you give your 10 minute intro and when we turn to, um, to Keith, um, I, I will particularly ask him to address the question of what does he see as the, you know, the, the constraints on both the um, international community and the United States in trying to um, assist in the current situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll just see how things go from there. How are Good. you feeling, by the way, down there? Uh, it's a bit hot. Uh, there's a lot of mosquitoes right now because uh, there's been, it's been raining in the afternoons. As a matter of fact, it uh, might rain as we're, we're speaking. There's a few drops that are coming down. Um, so uh, when that happens, you have a lot more mosquitoes coming up. Ah, uh, yes, of course. I do. Uh, I actually recall that. Yeah. I was trying to remember how many times I have actually been in Haiti during crises. Mm. And I think it is somewhere around 15 times <laughs> as mm. I came and went uh, multiple times in the mid 90s. And then again, when um, President Aristide was forced from office um, in, uh, uh, you know, about 15, what is it now, 15 years ago, 12 years ago. Yeah. And I was on the island when Baby Doc fell back in 86, uh, um, though I was in the Dominican Republic at the time. Right, so I, my um, my engagement goes back a long time. Uh, curiously, I was never assigned permanently to the embassy there, um, to many other embassies in the region, but not to that one. I see that Keith has joined. Hello, yeah. Mr. Mines, Louis Henry. Henry. Good to see you. Yes. Um, Keith, it's great to see you. Thanks uh, for being with us today. Um, did you get my short note on the run of show? I did. Yep, that sounds good. Good. When I turn to you, I will use a question, um, uh, uh, you know, and turn to you and ask you to to address the the sort of the the big issue of of where we are and and what the constraints are on on uh, um, both um, the international community and the U.S. for attempting in in our efforts to um, to help address the crisis. Um, I, I are you comfortable with that as a sure good mm -hmm. yeah good yeah and and how are things up there uh, good yeah we've got a good week we've got a good event tomorrow on diasporas uh, their role in we've got a Haitian American that'll be doing something on diasporas as part of a panel and then we have another good event on Thursday on uh, policing and social protest. Uh, so very active week, and uh, then coming Is up the on policing May and social protest project um, or program fo focused um, broadly or specific to Haiti. No, broadly, actually not Haiti at all. That one is on everything but Haiti. That's on uh, you know looking at the cases like Colombia and Chile, where a lot of kids got killed while protesting. So it's a question of could the police do that better? You know, how do you set those up to where where people don't get killed in the process? So. That one is on Thursday, and then we got we go a couple of weeks, and then we start in with OAS some OAS events. We've got an OAS sidebar, I think, on Haiti that we'll be hosting here, maybe with the secretary and some others. So I hope to get some attention when the OAS is up here the week of the uh, whenever that is, week of the nineteenth. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, we got a good good run of things. I'll try to get back down to Haiti. Um, Soon had a friend that was kidnapped that just got released, so that was good to hear. Mm. Um, um, out of curiosity, um, uh, and this is not relevant to, to today's program, 
Are you doing anything on El Salvador? Oh, yeah. Yep, that's another one of our priority countries. Yeah, yeah. That's a hard one to navigate right now because, you know, you really you have to, to do anything effective. You kind of need to have a good relationship with the government. But, you know, how do you navigate that space? I think we don't do this all that well. USIP is in a unique position, and I like it better than being in the government because you can sometimes explore options and you know, whole conversations that would be hard to do as a government official. Same with Venezuela. Venezuela, I'm able to get into spaces that you couldn't touch as a government official. But Salvador, um, we're doing what we're doing is trying to, we have a big uh, project on community dialogues. And so it's kind of how to increase the agency the communities have in justice and security issues, which up until now has been practically none. So it's a way using dialogues to do that. We pioneered that around the world, these justice and security dialogues. It's one that Haiti will need at a certain point, not yet, but you know, once justice and security is restored, it's one that for Haiti also, I think, would be really helpful. Again, uh, communities don't have a lot of agency on, on justice and security issues, so they band together and form vigilante groups, and, you know, that's kind of their agency. Yeah. But within, I, I was going to point out that there is a Reuters article out today um, about the vigilante yeah. uh, uh, activity in mm -hmm. Haiti, um, and to some degree, um, and this is just for us at this point, um, to, some, to some degree, it strikes me that this will resonate with some parts of the community in much the same way that Bukele's mm -hmm. strategies have resonated in El Salvador, which mm -hmm. is to say um, um, uh, a public thoroughly tired, uh, thoroughly exhausted by criminal violence right. will tend to support extreme measures. I don't know if that strikes you, um, Luis Henri, as, as a reasonable assertion, but um, it's, it certainly seems to me that part of our problem in dealing the hemisphere's problem and thinking about a place like El Salvador at the current moment is that while many people are concerned that it is becoming more authoritarian, the fact of the matter is that, that his, his strategy for dealing with the gangs um, is very popular. Well, right? you know, personally, I think that he's uh, pushing back. It, this is a temporary win for him, but, you know, prison is where communities are built faster than anywhere else. The experience of prison makes prisoners come together. And my instinct and feeling is that down the road, five years or 10 years down the road, El Salvador is going to have a huge problem with those guys. Yeah, I they think they're bonded right. together in those jails, you know, yeah. and uh, they're not going to be able to keep them in jail for the rest of their lives, right? So when they're going to come out, mm. they're going to come out even uh, with more solidarity, more sense of being a community and uh you know it's just was for me it's postponing uh something that's going to come out uh, with quite a bit of rage you know down the years that's what i sense yeah um, and that, goes, that goes to the question of the whole system i mean there's got to be a justice and system justice and security system across the board that functions and without that yeah you just end up with uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt here. We are one minute to start uh, the, the webinar. Then if uh, uh, Mr. Mines and Mr. Mars wants, want to uh, stop your video, uh, we'll start with uh, Ambassador Daddy to do the welcoming. And uh, then you will be called and then you will open your video and, and you will be all uh, sharing the screen. Then Ambassador, uh, we are 30 seconds to uh, start. Just tell me when we hit four, um, four o'clock um, yes, and I will uh, greet people. Do we have an audience? Uh, we are in practice session. Then uh, you can uh, stay in front of the, of, the, of the screen for 40 seconds while people populate, okay? Yep. Then I'm going to start the webinar right now and you are our face. You can Thank start you. at four one.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank, uh, thank you all for joining us uh, on this, um, what I hope will be a very lively and important discussion on the crisis in Haiti. Uh, um, my name is Patrick Duddy. I'm the director of Duke University's Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, as well as a, an advisor on global strategy for the university. Um, Previously, I served as uh, both a U.S. ambassador in Latin America and also as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Caribbean. I'm joined to do, today by two um, extraordinary experts, um, and um, I will act as a moderator for uh, Mr. Keith Mines. He is the director of the Latin American program at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, uh, he is uh, very accomplished in, in, and has been engaged in um, crisis management and, and also institution and, and indeed nation building in a uh, long list of countries. Um, he is also the author of uh, Why Nation Building Matters, Political Consolidation um, building security forces and economic development and failed and fragile states. Our second panelist is Mr. Louis Henri Mars. Um, he is the founder um, of an important peace building um, uh, NGO in Haiti. Um, and he comes to us today. Um, uh, from Foot of um, our, our focus um, will be on a discussion of both current circumstances and the search for a way forward in addressing uh, the current crisis. Let me give you um, just a little bit of guidance on format. Um, I will um, uh, make a very, very uh, few opening remarks and then turn to uh, Louis Henri, uh, to who will give us a sense of, of of circumstances on the ground, as well as a um, brief introduction to his and his organization's thinking at this point on the way forward. Uh, following uh, <clears throat> his remarks, I will turn to Mr. Mines, who will um, um, help us consider what some of the, um, the most urgent requirements are and the constraints on both the international community and the US um, uh, government's efforts um, to help in the, current, uh, in the current crisis. Our program in total should last um, perhaps a little bit more than one hour. Uh, uh, the second half of the program will be devoted to questions um, from all of you who are joining us today. Um, and um, some questions have been uh, uh, sent in in advance of the program, but we will also be regularly uh, checking the Q&A function. Um, that is how you should submit your questions. Um, and we will do our best to, um, to capture, if not the precise language of every question, certainly um, the intent um, of every question as we as we move forward. I'd like to begin by um, noting that uh, concern for circumstances in Haiti um, has become increasingly uh, acute since um, the assassination of the last president. Um, but it is also worth noting that um, uh, a hurricane 
an earthquake, and the COVID crisis have all served to um, to make the the um, the crisis there even um, even more severe. Of particular concern and widely reported in both um, regional and and global media have been the the rise and increasing potency of criminal gangs, um, uh, gangs which have at times uh, uh, largely controlled access to the ports and consequently to um, uh, relief supplies, um, which have um, been forwarded by um, the Friends of Haiti around the world. Um, I have personally uh, uh, been contacted by any number of, of people working in the, um, the NGO, NGO community, including m medical missionaries, who have found the, um, uh, the, the, the chaotic and often violent circumstances on the ground in Haiti um, particularly intimidating, and it is my understanding that some of these organizations have in recent months been unable to deliver the services um, which they are prepared to deliver and have been delivering from, for some years. Um, current circumstances to me um, look as severe as any I can recall. And I was um, on the island when baby Doc fell in 86. And I worked with the international community in both the mid 90s and 2005 and six um, after uh, both uh, crises occasioned by uh, uh, President, former President Aristide's first his overthrow and then his um, in, in, uh, in the mid 90s and, and the subsequent uh, episode in which he was forced from from office in 2004. Um, uh, the present moment, uh, in, even in that context and given that history, uh, seems to me um, uh, even more dangerous um, from uh, a host of different perspectives. Uh, with that, by way of preamble, I'd like to turn to um, Louis-Henri Mars, um, uh, for um, a uh, a brief sort of review of circumstances on the ground and his current thinking on the um, on the way forward, Louis Henry. Yes, thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight uh, to discuss and look together at a way forward for Haiti, and uh, it's my pleasure to be on this call with you all, Keith, uh, Patrick, and uh, the public at large. Um, Haiti has been going through another convulsion, another one again, and uh, it's worth to look at both the present issue, but also at, uh, at the deeper issues quickly that uh, we're facing. So uh, let me, share my screen and uh, go here. So one of the things that we need to, to really believe in is that peace is possible, we, but we must believe there's a lot of negative talk in Haiti and outside of Haiti about Haiti, about the possibility of peace, but peace is possible in Haiti if we walk deliberately towards it. Now, um, this is a map of the gangs in of Haiti, of Port-au-Prince, basically. Then you have other gangs in the Artiboni Valley and around the country. And they basically surround the city, uh, both to the south of the city. You cannot go south without passing in front of them. You cannot go north. You cannot go east or northeast and they control all of the downtown area. Now, there has been a movement of uh, retaliation of uh, a part of the population against those gangs. That was what was called Wakale movement. But actually it happened only in neighborhoods where the gangs were not 
very strong. They were not like the original headquarters of those gangs. And they were mostly uh, outside post lieutenants and soldiers posted in the outside of the uh, main neighborhood. So the, the, the Martis area is still in the hands of uh, very much of the gangs. Downtown uh, Cité Soleil, uh, deep into the Quadrebouquet area, and also uh, to the east, uh, the Casibaria gang uh, with Vitelom, they still control their headquarters area. Um, <clears throat> some of the smaller groups have been eliminated, um, but you, there is a tendency again for uh, kidnappings to come back up after uh, about a month of a lull. And uh, they are the, the, the gangs who control the roads down to the south and to the north have actually increased the cost of uh, the taxes that they uh, perceive on commercial traffic and private traffic going uh, through to the south or to the north or to the east of the city. What is to be done? First of all, the, the, the main question that has to be asked and that has to be asked of the powers that are running the government, the government is, is the will to transform the, 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 this situation, is the will there? Is it really there? If it's there, it is possible to transform this situation. The first thing that you need to do is to have a credible threat of destruction. The PNH has to be put into a position that it can attack some of the smaller groups and turn around and create examples for the larger groups to understand that their destruction is there. If they don't believe that, they're not going to come to the negotiating table. You have to quarantine the virus, the gang virus. The issue with the kidnappings is that there are areas of the city that the police does not go into. There are sanctuaries where they bring kidnapped people and the gangs are totally comfortable in those sanctuaries. You cannot kill them for the time being. You cannot kill the virus. What do you do? You isolate it. You quarantine it. So this is, and not just some of the gangs, all of them need to be quarantined because you want to bring them into a situation where they have to talk. You have to stop the flow of arms. Both uh, the UN and the US government concede that 90% of the guns and ammunition that are restocking the gangs are coming from the United States. There has been arrests made. There has been attempts at slowing down the flow of arms, but this is a issue that has to be taken at the highest level and that has to be dealt with so that the, the armament of the gangs is curtailed and they get the message that they're not gonna be able to resupply as easy as they are doing it now. And then you have to provide them also with a way out. If you only give them the, the, the option either to go to jail or to die, they are not gonna take, they're gonna resist and there's gonna be a lot of collateral damage. So you must create a process for them, a process that they can trust for them to choose to, 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 bring, down, to bring down their guns. Good. A lot of people focus only on the gangs, but the issue is not just the gangs. The whole social pyramid has to be involved in transforming this situation. A lot of the conflicts that are happening at the levels of the communities come from interest groups at the top of the pyramid, 
whether it's uh, from the private sector, but political sector, but also in the international community and in the diaspora that are fighting through gang violence. So if the whole of the social pyramid is not involved in seeking a solution, we are not going to go very far just by focusing on the gangs. There has to be a dialogue throughout Haitian society on what is Haitian society? Who's a Haitian? Why is there a need to use gangs and arms to come to power, to hold to power for business uh, purposes? The, the, the habit of using armed groups to, to bring people to power or to keep power has to be eradicated from the Haitian system. The gangs are only part of the issue in the neighborhoods. There is a structural violence in the neighborhoods that come from a system, practices, policies, public policies, a culture that allows a small group of people the ability to extract enormous wealth at the expense of a vast majority of people through exploitation of the economy, the national budget, there's social discrimination, limited access to education, and limited access to social services. If we do not address those issues, we will always have an issue with violence, secondary violence, individual destruction, community destruction through gangs, and national and international destruction through terrorism, civil war, coup d'etats, et cetera. So as we are working on the specific issue of disarming gangs, we also need to work on transforming the structural violence that exists in Haitian society. If, if this is, if, please. Yeah, this is Vladimir. Yes, we need to work on the mass of people that are using guns, but we also need to, to focus on the individual. Vladimir is a young man that went through a process of trauma healing. He learned about trauma healing, and then he was uh, attacked in a, in a vengeance mode because he was in conflict with another boy. Because of his training, he chose not to retaliate anymore. And he decided that the conflict was gonna stop there. He's part of our processes. He lives in a neighborhood that has a lot of violence and is an agent of change and transformation in that neighborhood. So we need to, to work with the individual as well as with <clears throat> groups, especially youth groups, so that they act as agents to interrupt violence in the neighborhoods and to become agents of change and models that are different than the model of the gang leader that is the, the, the model of the youth right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Louis Henri. I, I, I think this really gets us started in a very interesting way. And in, in the, um, uh, the photograph of that, of, of that young man, um, I, I think, helps to illustrate just how, how, how really <clears throat> um, disturbing the, the circumstances on the ground are. Uh, there are a number of things I hope we'll get to it within the next hour. Okay. Um, certainly, there, there is something that is embedded in your presentation, which is your sense that um, Haiti needs to proceed um, on several different tracks, more or less simultaneously. My sense is that the international community, um, at least at this point, in answer to the calls by the interim government by the president of the Dominican Republic and, and, and elsewhere would suggest that, that many believe um, that the rule of law must be reestablished as a first step um, before moving on to, to some of the other issues. I, I'm not quite sure how to address that myself. What I would like to do uh, now in turning to Keith uh, Mines from the US Institute of Peace it's considered the, the, the question of, um, of what can the international community do 
what constrains that the community um and and particularly what um what constraints does he see as limiting the um uh, the response of the united states keith great thanks um yeah i'd be happy to to give that a shot um I, i'll build a little bit on both of your previous remarks patrick and and louis henry um what I what I saw, I, I served in Haiti in the 90s, 95 to 97, and then I've been back and forth uh, since then and touching it from other different jobs in Washington, most recently there a couple months ago. And um, what, what I came away with, uh, and this is a chapter of my book, um, uh, and there's a nice discount code on LinkedIn. If you hit my LinkedIn site, you can get a discount on the book. So a little book sale here while I can. Um, but one of the things that I, I walked away with was I, I never thought uh, in the time that I was there, and, and, and it's actually gotten worse since, that, that we really came to terms with how far it, we had to go, we collectively, Haitians and the international community, to build a, a democratic functional society. And that was a, a result of a lot of things. Uh, Patrick, you mentioned it, but I mean, you had a whole 19th century of isolation and privation in Haiti. Then you had a 20th century with more isolation and and Duvalier, there's a very good. Um, I just happened to listen to it over the weekend, but a very good series of uh, podcasts in the, the the podcast series Real Dictators, and it's got a three part series on Duvalier. But it's a reminder of of how destructive he was, not only to Haitian politics and security, but to society itself, and how far he took the country down this really really uh, negative, even evil. Uh, uh, place. So, you know, coming out of that only in the, in the mid 90s, it's only been 30 years. That sounds like a long time. It's really not um, in, the, in the life of a, of a society that's recovering from what Haiti had been through. It's not very long. What I went, what I came away with, even in the mid 90s, was that Haiti would need a long term accompaniment. And I think we get very confused about this very early. We immediately talk about invasions and interventions, and then we get excited. But you know, it, it's an accompaniment by the international community that I think would would need it to go on for a long time, but at a very consistent level and in a very selective and strategic areas. And and I think that Louis has uh, has done a very good job of outlining a couple of those. And I'll I'll kind of riff off of some of that because he's got I think one of the really key things he identified, and I'd like to to play on that a little bit as well. Um, why is there this need for for this company? Well, if you look at all the different components of of, uh, of 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 what Haiti needs, they all kind of add up to again something that could be that could be helped by the international community. I mean, and and some of it is is a result of bad decisions by the international community. We have to take, I think, some accountability for that. On the humanitarian side, the industrial capacity of Haiti was almost completely hollowed out by our sanctions policy pre, pre-90s um, and has, has never really recovered from that. On economics and trade, policy is just not something that's really come together within Haiti, but there's, there's opportunities that have never really cohered. Uh, government management in general is another place where I think that, um, that we often got diverted. There's a very good article in the last issue of Christianity Today. It's in the April um, e, um, uh, edition, I, I, April issue. It's called What Evangelicals Owe Haiti. It's very good. It talks about the empire of NGOs that has been created in Haiti, where almost everything goes into the private sector, the NGO sector, and almost nothing into building government capacity. And as a result, the government capacity has always been weak. There's always been a, an issue with international coordination never been very good and something that, that is there's a need for that. Now on the security system, which is even more acute, um, on the police, the Haitian police did well with advisors. Um, it was something that to me was very obvious that if there was a, the difference between success and failure was, was really just a handful of advisors, why would we not have just kept that? But there was also this question early on about the heavy force that was needed once you've exceeded the ability of the police to manage, and every country has a, an escalatory ladder where you can go up higher to a, 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 a more robust force when it's needed. But with the disbandment of the army in the 90s, which was done for very reasonable, um, a, a very good rationale, um, it, it never really developed the capacity to keep up with what are now these very 
these very heavily armed gangs, and the prisons, again, never quite uh, came together. The judiciary was a very long-term project. Um, it's a very complex system that Haiti inherited, and uh, it, was all, it was always destined to have a, a legislative component as well as a technical component that was going to take decades um, to get right. Now, all this comes, comes down, th that's kind of all the technical things, but on the political side, and this is what Louis talked about that I thought was, was really spot on, there's this question, as I call it in my book, uh, political consolidation. But how does a country pull together with a vision and a strategy and, and a sense of belonging? And, um, and, and that's something that I think is hard in Haiti because there's not a natural mechanism for that. There's not a Philadelphia moment as we had. There's not a quartet um, as, lib as um, uh, was the case in Tunisia, although that's kind of gone off the rails. There's not a Loya Jirga as there, there is in Afghanistan where there's a natural way that citizens come together historically to make decisions. That's something that still has to be created um, in Haiti. And we've been, been very focused for, for quite a while here at USIP on the question of how to, to build an, a national dialogue, or as Louis Henry calls it, a citizen's dialogue. And I think that's spot on. It's something that doesn't now exist. And there's always a kind of impatience, like we can't wait for that. That's going to take too long. Let's just rush through yet another elite dialogue. And then the elites make the decision. Nobody's involved. So that's something that I think really, and I like those slides that uh, Louis Henry that you showed, those were really spot on that there's got to be a way to pull things up from the bottom into decisions. Um, so going forward, um, the question of who leads, that was actually a long diversion before I answer your question, Patrick, but who leads something like this? Look, I mean, on the high end, the, 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 this is a natural case again for the UN. And I, I understand the, U, the UN's baggage because of the the cholera epidemic and because of the sexual predation, but it, there's a lot of things in play here as I tried to very briefly outline. It, the UN is the only organization that has all of the components to do that. It, it, if it isn't could, to be used, then you, know, you, you kind of very quickly go down the path to inadequate solutions. There is a low end solution, which is what we've been in for almost the last two years of allowing for a quote unquote Haitian solution to emerge. The problem with that is that there's no pure Haitian solution because the international community is already involved. So you can't really have it both ways where we're saying, let's let Haitians sort this out. But oh, by the way, we've already tipped the scales in favor of the current government. The, the international community, I think, has to accept that it's involved already and it needs to, you know, to pivot with circumstances and get to a, a, better, a better option. So the middle grade option is something of a coalition on security, I guess, and then some kind of a political process, which is supported. But those two things have to somehow be blended. And it's, it's really tricky to do this. Uh, it's you know, not something that's easy. There's, it's a puzzle that's always missing a few pieces, but it's something that, that has been done before. And, and I think with a certain amount of ambition and some resources and, and the right people, it could be done. But those two things have to somehow be blended. Now, who's in a position to do this? Again, the UN is the natural um, leader. Um, the OAS has taken a very proactive uh, course on Haiti and is very, very uh, helpful right now in a lot of this. The OAS is in a very unique position, frankly, in Haiti right now. The U.S., I think without the U.S., nothing is going to work. So the U.S., um, whether components can be led by others or not, I think the U.S. really does have to, to be the one that, uh, that, that pulls together uh, some of this. Brazil, I think, could do a lot has done more in the past. Canada is an obvious uh, partner. And then Chile, of course, has a unique place as well. Now, what are the restraints? The restraints are, are a number, there's a number of them. One is casualties. Nobody wants to take any casualties. And I think most countries, if there were to be um, an, a security accompaniment, uh, there would be casualties this time, probably more than in the past. And I think people are simply fearful of that. I think there's a concern about the commitment. If you watch the dance between the different parties, Everyone is trying to talk someone else into doing, is taking the lead, knowing that once you take the lead, you, you really can't get out. There's a lot of distraction right now. Ukraine, um, of course, the U.S. is entering a, an election cycle. And there's really this sense of anti-intervention. Um, uh, intervention right now on both sides of the political spectrum in the United States has got a kind of a bad, a bad name. Uh, there's a willingness in Ukraine because it's mostly about writing checks, but uh, but anything on the ground I think is just negative right now. 
So um, it, that, that's uh, we can explore some of that a little bit further. But um, you know, we're at a place where I think getting to that political consolidation, providing the mechanism where Haitians can make that those decisions, I think really is the key. Supported and buttressed immediately at the and in conjunction by some kind of a security reset, which will require some outside uh, force, I think, to to assist. And just one final point, um, the question somebody I, I saw in the chat already mentioned Montana. So there is there is this ongoing question about Montana versus um, versus December 21. Um, I, I, I don't favor one or the other or, or, or any other options. Um, we at USIP try to provide a neutral place to explore all of these. What I would say is that um, I think Montana could easily have been the solution, could have been the way forward um, if it had been supported when it first came up. I think it's a little bit late now. Uh, I am quite seized, as you see from my publications with December 21, the, the, the accord. And the reason is because I think it does provide the architecture, if it's properly supported, to, to do the, the national dialogue-like process um, that is essential right now to, to getting the people behind a, a new government and, and providing the, the popular support that it will need. So I think that architecturally, December 21 is quite good. It's got issues. Uh, it would need to be leadership expanded. It needs to be resourced. There needs to be a secretariat. But if you look at all the different components of it, I think it's actually, it was well designed. And I think absent something else, it's cer certainly something to get behind. Because one of the chilling things right now is nobody knows what to get behind. What, do, what is it we're gonna to try to support? Thanks. Patrick, you're on mute. Pa Patrick, you're on mute. You Louise, uh, Louise Henri, I wanted to come to you very quickly. Um, I think one question that many of us have partially um, because of the, the the spotty nature of international reporting on, on Haiti, is who speaks for Haiti at the moment? Um, the Those associated with um, the government, which is barely holding on, the Montana group, those involved in the December 21 conversations, and should those of us who if you will, are concerned and see ourselves as part of the international community uh, um, and, and are committed and interested in, in seeing um, progress on the ground, do, should we understand that the, the, the Haitian people would welcome some kind of international rescue effort? Who speaks for Haiti? The, the, national, the government in place has the responsibility of speaking for Haiti. Um, the thing is uh, that it only represents a, a, a faction in the middle of the uh, factions that are vying for power in Haiti. Um, it's facing, it has faced off, it's facing off still with uh, the Montana Accord groups. There's other groups that have uh, come and gone in terms of their own accords, and uh, and so um, they just have they're, they're in a position right now of power and uh, and responsibility. Now, uh, yes, there is a sense in Haiti that uh, the national police needs to be uh, backed up by some kind of international force. We believe, I believe that the the job of going into the neighborhoods has to be given to the national police and not to this foreign force, but that the national police be trained and be, uh, especially at the level of command and control. I think that there's been a, uh, big issues of command and control for the national police and, uh, and that it's, it's our role as Asians to take care of our own business. So uh, for me, it would have to be in terms of uh, technical technical assistance, training, and and leadership training, and uh, strategy and tactics. Uh, I I believe it it can be done, and uh, there are police officers that are dedicated to their job, 
there are issues of corruption that can be taken care of if there's a real uh, uh, will to to turn around the police force. I, I guess you know my the my my response to that is to say on the one hand I agree with you that that needs to happen. My, my but but I wonder if it can happen before a um, a, a greater degree of um, uh, pacification takes place, and and are the Haiti, Haitian National Police in a position to work with, um, or do they need to work with an international rescue force of some kind to um, reestablish the rule of law and to reduce criminal violence? Yes, I believe that they are in a position to do so. It is uh, extremely important that it's Haitians who take the lead in transforming what they are facing right now. Uh, going into those neighborhoods needs to be done in a very, uh, I'd say, careful way so as to not create more collateral damage. If you start uh, uh, killing uh, fathers and mothers and leave the children without you know, parents, then you're creating the basis for more gangs to develop. It's, it's, not, it's not the right course of action. The right course of action is for those who know how to do this, the locals take care of this situation. Now, that's the function of the national police. And I believe also that the army has to be rehabilitated. There, when you're facing uh, people that are using color cocktail molotovs and that are searching for uh, solutions to the armed trucks, you're going over and above what the police force is, is designed to do. So, you know, you have to build uh, the Haitian capacity to defend the, the population. And uh, it's not by going in and doing the job for them that you're doing that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have, um, I have I now quite a number of questions from our viewing audience, as well as some that came in ahead of time. Um, uh, uh, Louis Henri, you and, 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 and Keith have already happily managed to, to address some of them. But um, uh, one that just came in over the transom was uh, from uh, Jessica Byron Reed, who asked, um, is there a role for regional actors like the Dominican Republic or Jamaica or Haiti or CARICOM as, as a whole? Um, uh, and Keith, if I may, I'll start with you and then move to Louis Henry. Yeah, so uh, I just kind of go through those quickly. The Dominican Republic is actually problematic just because of the the, the right. way they have been treating Haitians. So that's they're they're not a. I actually had that idea myself, and I was shut down quite quickly. It's not they're not a good actor. They could have done more, I think, in a, in and in previously, but but currently they're a, they would be problematic. The rest of CARICOM, I think, is um, there's a lot of countries that have been calling for. <clears throat> Um, more support. Jamaica very early on offered to uh, to provide a police contingent. So I think different parts of the Caribbean could be um, helpful. Cuba, I don't think has, you know, Cuba could be helpful on med medical missions and things like that, but those are readily available from anywhere. Um, but on, on the key things of putting together a, um, a political task force, a, a security task force, you know, I think CARICOM absolutely needs to be involved. One of the problems, again, I, I would cite historically is just isolation. Haiti has, has traditionally been isolated. So yeah. to have this neighborhood that it is a part of, and I worked on, Patrick, as you did as well, a lot of the transitions in, in Eastern Europe, and it was a diff totally different world when there's a, a neighborhood that you know one transitions into. Haiti's never had that. And um, it, it has the United States, uh, as a very key partner, and because of the size of the diaspora here, there's a very strong association that's that's actually much more useful than I think. Even on the informal side, people sometimes give it credit for. So there's, it's not you know, it's not Albania, but it's not a country that has a, a, an easy association. So Caricom, I think, yes, 
and some of the Caribbean could be helpful again on both the security and the political side. And then there's other regional players that could be very helpful. Chile is, is tremendously uh, helpful, I think, as a, as a partner. Um, Brazil, not sure what role they're going to play now, but has obviously had uh, experience in Haiti. Canada, always there. So yeah, there's a number of, of countries that I think would be would be helpful, but the Caribbean is going to have a unique role and I think really uh, could be quite helpful. Hard to get a decision though. I mean, it's CARICOM's a whole bunch of different countries and it's hard to get consensus, but absolutely a place where a lot could be done. Luis, uh, uh, Louis-Henri, um, what, what is your view on the, the possibility of, of regional assistance? I concur with uh, Keith's uh, statement. I think that uh, there are uh, historical issues between us and the Dominican Republic that need reconciling before any uh, direct involvement of the Dominican Republic uh, in, uh, in the Haitian issues. Now, you, because of the number of Haitians that live in the Dominican Republic and the investments that Haitians have made in the Dominican Republic, it is clear that there, there's a role for them in facilitating processes uh, to, to, to change the, uh, the, the situation of conflict, but uh, uh, direct involvement with boots on the ground, it's, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not at all, at all uh, recommended. Um, and yes, for the Caribbean to be involved because of the historical uh, colonial past that they have uh, uh, experienced, which is uh, similar, uh, if not like, like the Haitian colonial past. Brazil has uh, the same kind of background. Um, the understanding that needs to be had is that there is extreme division, historical division in Haiti that needs to be uh, reconciled. We are a multicultural, multi-ethnic, uh, former colony. And we have not accepted the fact that we are multi multicultural, multi-ethnic. Uh, the United States has been able to, to blend into a melting pot the various uh, sources of its population up to a certain point. There's issues in the US also, but uh, we in Haiti have not yet been able to do that. So people who have the same background in terms of uh, colonial slavery are more able to understand what's going on in Haiti than, than, than people who do not have that kind of experience. And the, 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 what we have to, to look for between us in Haiti through dialogue, through working together, through collaborating together after rehumanizing each other is that sense of being one community, one nation. And, uh, and that all of the sources, whether it's westernized sources or from African sources, they all have value and we, we need to put them together. So uh, yes, with the help of, of our Caribbean friends, I think we can do that. Well, thank you. That, that was a terrific response. Thank you ever so much. Um, you know, another, another question that has, um, has come up and, and Keith, I think you've, you've addressed it at least in part. Um, uh, but it is based on something that you have written uh, recently, which was, has the United States um, in its efforts to assist in the current crisis called on some of the, um, the, the leadership and the institutions in Haiti that we were investing in over the last, we the United States were investing in over the last 10, 15, 20 years, certainly since the, um, uh, you know, the Global Fragility Act. Yeah, the, the Global Fragility Act is actually an interesting um, development. It, it is a, 
an act of Congress uh, that, that designates um, or that mandates that the U.S. government do a better job of coordinating its assistance for, for fragile states, um, of which Haiti has been named as, as one, I think legitimately. Um, Haiti is a bit of an outlier in the sense that it faces a current crisis and not just a long-term crisis as some of the others do. Uh, Mozambique is, is one example that's in, in Africa and uh, Papua New Guinea and Asia in, in the Pacific. So those are countries with kind of longer term uh, problems. Haiti, Haiti needs to address the current crisis before it even gets into the long term, but it, it tries to take, uh, it does several things differently. It, it takes a long term approach, a 10 year approach to, to helping a, a state that is experiencing bouts of fragility. It uh, insists on listening to Haitian voices. I think there's been more of that you know, recently than, um, than there has been in the past. So it's, it's trying to to uh, drive US policies from a position of listening to uh, Haitians. And then again, uh, tries to get all elements of the US government working together. So it, it's something that's fresh. It's something new um, that, that could be helpful. Again, I think the, the challenge is getting over the, the, the current crisis where there's a, just an, a, a reset of a political process, which right now doesn't doesn't exist. I mean, we're two years, almost two years after the assassination. We still there's still not a popularly elected government, and frankly, there's not one on the horizon. So there's an immediate political issue that is impeded by the security uh, issue as well. Those two have to be taken together. I think there needs to be a jolt, if you will, in both of those to get to a place where you can reset. Could I riff off a couple other questions there? There was one about, um, wasn't the Montana group a good example of a national uh, national dialogue? And then another question about December 21. Maybe I could go back to that real quick because I think it is really kind of one of the key areas sure. in the political, the political dynamic. So Montana was a much expanded um, Accord that involved uh, a number of organizations, so it was it was much broader than certainly what is the current government, and much broader than what has been and has been uh, in the past. Um, but it was still somewhat limited. Again, for whatever reason, wasn't embraced by the international community, and within Haiti, it just never quite was able to to do what it wanted to do, which was to um, to govern. Um, and then you had December 21, which was an accord by a broader and even broader array of civil society, business, and political actors, still limited, but, but broader perhaps than Montana. The one piece of that that I would again point to, and it goes back to the security issues that Louis Henry uh, raised, was th this concept of roundtables. And this is one key part of the architecture, which I think has not been focused on, but if it's if it's fully resourced and and developed, this this December 21 accord is supposed to roll out these roundtables, which are broad discussions among civil society on the different elements of, of, of what's needed. So on security, on education, on the economy, and so forth. Those are starting to they're they're starting to take off, but they're really difficult to get going with the security environment. But that is the architecture that should bring together some of this. And on the security side, what it would do, this will hit another question that was in there, is, is start to get communities involved in their own security. And this is something that we do at USIP. If you look at our website under uh, justice and security dialogues, we have a whole program for that, where we find that, that, that communities that don't have agency and don't, are not involved in their own security are typically unsafe. And, and now we've swung you know, from, from no involvement to, to vigilante involvement. We kind of passed right over the question of having strong, capable institutions which, which citizens would, uh, would support. And that's not the citizen's fault, it's the fault of not having that uh, on offer. But if I think, you know, there were this, uh, this system where citizens are involved in a dialogue with their, their local police, their local justice systems, and then have the agency and the ability to impact that. This is the kind of thing, again, that, that uh, Louis Henry's uh, organization is a specialist at. That, that's a really, I think, important component of it. And then as security starts to reset, this goes to another question somebody asked about, you know, how do you deal with the gangs? That's a really tricky question. On the one hand, you don't want to empower them. You don't want to do things that will leave them politically empowered where they basically fought their way into power through you know rape violence and all this other stuff that's not where you want to be it's 
a little bit like where the Khmer Rouge ended up in Cambodia. Sometimes you can't avoid it, but I wouldn't say we're at a point where that can't be avoided. So on the other hand, you don't want this thing to, to string out forever. So they're, you know, they've established themselves in a way they'll have to be dealt with. And some combination of counterforce and negotiation will probably be what will be needed. But again, with agency by citizens, where they have a say in what's going on, and they're not just inactive uh, non-agents in as things are, are done to them rather than with them. So that's that's the part of the, again, the architecture that I think still needs to be me involved. And then just one final point, somebody did point out the assistance that has been given to the HMP. The HMP has gone through real bouts of effective- HMP, by the way, you mean the Haitian, Haitian National, National Police? Yeah, sorry. They've gone through real, they've gone through lots of ups and downs, but there have been plenty of times when, as one of one of the comments pointed out, that 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 with international accompaniment and, and frankly very little, it's not like you know they were being supervised by foreigners, but, that, but they had accompaniment on operations and intelligence and logistics and some of the things that were helpful to them as a force. There are times when they've been quite effective and they produced a, not, a real a string of really good leaders. I know some of the leaders that have been in and out of the security forces, but it just hasn't been consistent. And then the current crisis is that they're just now out, they're out, outgunned. I mean, they've just, they just could not keep up with the heavy arms that the gangs were able to acquire, as someone else pointed out, mostly from the United States through the Dominican Republic. So there's, you know, there's that issue as well that needs to be dealt with as a package. Um, but, but absolutely the, you know, the human raw material is there. It's just a matter of structure, leadership, and things like that. And somebody pointed out salary. They're actually paid more than, than the average Haitian. Um, so, I mean, there's there's always going to be budget and salary issues, but yeah, there's there's a whole package that would need to go into a restored HMP, but I don't think it can be done right now without some accompaniment that would help them with this jolt of reestablished security to get, get back on track. And then from there, I'm sure they can handle it. Uh, let me, um, if I may, combine elements of two or three questions that, that have come in, and I, I hope I do this in a helpful way. Um, First and foremost, uh, uh, what can, you know? Do either of you think um, that there is a way forward for the United States to be supportive of Haitian sovereignty um, and and, um, and also encourage the kind of um, sort of broad-based international support that the current crisis seems to require? You know, one of the, the the questions came in, suggested, um, or or argued that I was suggesting a, a way forward that would undermine Haitian sovereignty, and I I didn't mean to um, to uh, to suggest that if that's the way uh, my remarks came across. What what I'm uh, have been looking at primarily is the the sense that I have that there has been a chorus of calls for assistance. But there's no real under, uh, consensus on what that assistance should look like, um, uh, and and um, I was wondering if if either of you has a a formula for, in particular, the kind of U.S. leadership, uh, Keith, that you said you thought was necessary for things to come together. Um, at the same time, recognizing, um, as many people would insist that our policies in the past have contributed to the current mess. Yes, uh, I believe that uh, one of the issues that the US can help with is the issue of uh, mediation and facilitation of uh, dialogue processes in Haiti. Um, the the uh, September uh, 21 Accord is in power. It cannot be a neutral facilitator of roundtable dialogue. It has a vested interest in keeping power. Okay, so uh, it cannot be facilitating uh, a dialogue process. This has to be done by outside actors, civil society, Haitian civil society actors, with the backing of specialized international professionals that have been doing this uh, over the years in different societal contexts. The context must be 
a Haitian led context, but the techniques, the savoir faire, the uh, various tools can come from uh, uh, professionals in the US that have been doing that or other countries like Ireland that we've been working with right. at uh, La Colape, you know, for a long time. That it's a, it's a, it's a double whammy, I'd say. You have to, first of all, make sure that the national police deals with the gangs. The, the gangs control all of the voting blocks in Port-au-Prince and in the Artiboni Valley right now. There is a tendency to push towards elections, you know, and if these elections happen without the gangs being subdued, you're gonna have more of the same that we had over the past 10 years. Um, so that has to be taken care of. But in parallel, the social issues have to be addressed also, because if you only take care of the gangs and you don't take care of the social issues, then you're, you're just, uh, <laughs> let me not say something about in the wind, but uh, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're not going anywhere. Right. So you, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double movement. And uh, the lessons I believe that the US has learned from its past involvement in other countries like Vietnam or Afghanistan or Iraq is that it's the locals who know the context, who know the people, who can go under the table and, and find what is the real interests that are at play. Usually that does not happen. You have uh, people from the outside that come in, that stay a weekend, that stay a week maximum, and then they go back. Okay, and, and they've, they don't know the, they, they don't know deeply the context that's involved and they've never had the time to go under the table and find out what's the problem here? What's the problem there? Can we find common ground? And that takes time. It takes understanding of the context of the people, of the interests that are at play throughout the whole of uh, the social pyramid, not just with the politics, not just with the politicians, not just with the Haitians in Haiti, the Haitians in the diaspora, the oligarchs, the, the, the back country, the separation between uh, uh, the back country and the cities. All of these have to be examined in order to go to move forward in a sensible way. And there is a role, I believe, for the United States in the international community in providing those kinds of uh, resources for the Haitian civil society actors that are willing to set aside their partisan perceptions and work as neutral brokers in transforming this situation. Thank you. You know, I, I wanted to uh, throw out one more question that came in from our audience. It's, it, it, it is a really fundamental one. Uh, Louis Henri, uh, you touched on it in your opening remarks. <clears throat> the gangs are powerful. Um, they, they are and have been violent. Um, there seems to be um, considerable concern um, or even uh, uh, the belief that most, certainly many, but very possibly most of the, um, the weapons are coming in from the United States. Um, is there anything that we can do about that? Keith, perhaps you'd like to give it a shot. Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, I mean, part of it, I think, is it, it will be hard to do some of this without having uh, our personnel on the ground. So some of this in, you know, they're either coming into the port or they're coming across the border. Again, the, the question of having um, advisors mm -hmm. and others that could accompany and catch those things as they're coming in. There's not a whole, it's not a you know, Mexico-like situation where there's a million containers a day coming in, coming across. It's right. a limited amount that could be searched, but it would it would take, I think, some people on our side to do that. I, on the U.S. side, there's probably more that could be done to, to go after those suppliers. I don't know that there's a real push for that right now. That's something that probably could be done better to find out who is supplying them and really go after them so it you know it's something that they don't just get away with um there is a question i think about the the diaspora um 
what can they do? And I, I think it's a it's a legitimate one. That's one issue. But I think there's part of the the frozenness I think we have right now is nobody's quite sure what to do. What do we get behind? And one of the things I I hate to say it, but the anti-interventionist um, mindset right now is so strong that I think people are able to hide behind you know the Haitians don't want us to intervene, so we'll just leave it alone. And I think that's a there's a bit of a chilling uh, impact there. Um, so it, even some of the the lower level things that could be done, but are still a bit as assertive or are, are being ducked. But yeah, I think and so I think mobilizing support in the United States, it's a little bit slow right now. In the 90s, if you remember, the Black Caucus was very strong on Haiti, very committed and not always prescriptive, but just, you know, keep the 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 focus on Haiti. And let's collectively try to figure out, you know, what to do and what's needed. That's not really. There's just nothing like that right now, and it's not something that that one uh, one sees. And so I think there's not a political imperative to do anything. And in fact, quite the opposite. Um, not doing anything is probably the safest course of action. It's a bit cowardly, but it's um, but it is one that you, you don't get in trouble for not doing anything. You get in trouble for doing something that doesn't go well. Yeah, you know. Um... On, on a, that, that is a, a little. It's disheartening to to hear you say that on a certain level, but I but I understand why. Um, you know, another. We only have time for a couple more questions um, uh, and comments. I, I do have one that's a, a, I think another pretty practical one is, um, what can the community that wishes to supply uh, food and medical assistance? What can they do? Are there organizations in Haiti with which they should be working most directly? Louis Henri, perhaps you could take that question. Well, first of all, uh, let me go back to the issue of the arms. Okay. okay. I'm not. I'm not saying that there's laws to be changed in the United States. I'm not saying that United States government should take on um, actors in the U.S. Uh, that are uh, legal actors, but it's something that is being repeated here in Haiti quite a bit. If it was a communist insurgency that was encircling Port-au-Prince, there would not be guns coming from the United States to refuel them. If it was an Islamist, if it was an Islamist insurgency that was encircling Port-au-Prince, there would not be weapons coming from the United States to rearm them, okay? There are not a thousand ports for those things to come through. The Dominican Republic border, there's enough hands that can be trained to seal it if there is the will to do that. And it's not gonna cost a hundred, hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars to do that. There just has to be the will to get this done. Now, yes, there are uh, organizations in Haiti that are involved in humanitarian uh, uh, activities. Um, I'm, I'm not in the humanitarian side of things. I'm in the peace building side of things and it would be very difficult for me to recommend one or another. Uh, I believe that there are uh, uh, networks of organizations that can be uh, can be uh, found that have the capacity to handle uh, different uh, needs of people who want to help out in terms of humanitarian. One of them is uh, Food for the Poor Haiti. Um, they, they handle containers and containers and containers uh, every day of uh, humanitarian aid. You know, I just said I wouldn't, but I did. <laughs> okay. Um, uh... You know, it's it's a little after five now. Um, one of the um, one of our our viewers has written in to say that um, uh, there have been interesting points made uh, by all of us, um, but he um, hasn't heard a plan. Um, my sense is there isn't a plan at the moment, but I would like to to invite each of you um, to make a couple of closing remarks. Where do we go from here? Um, and is it, um, is it a matter of coming up with a plan and then finding the money? Or is it a matter of finding money and participants and then coming up with a plan? 
You want me to start? Go ahead. Sure. Sure. No, look, I, I I think there is the outlines of a plan already in, in play. I think it just needs support. I think that the plan would be for the international community, the key actors, to come together and say, you know, enough is enough. It's time to, to put together with uh, key Haitian actors a plan for, for progress. And that would, uh, that would, again, go in two directions. On the security side, it, it, will, it would be to, to work through the different options. And, and what I would do, we've, we've recommended this, is to look at what would be needed to reset security, what can Haiti do on its own, and then look at that gap and figure out who fills it. And I don't think that's been done quite that way. And then, you know, the, the gap could be filled in the minimal way possible, but I think there's a lot of options that have not been considered. I think more could be done with um, with um, regional security, with, with private security forces. There's ways to do that. That's a whole other can of worms. But how do you reset, reset security? And then on the political side, if the goal is a free and fair election as soon as possible, what is, you know, what is the, the projected date for for that being possible and what needs to happen to get to it, a roadmap for Haiti. And I think there's the rudiments of that between December 21, between some goodwill on Montana to join with the, the December 21 forces, commit to these round tables, get Haitian society involved, and then start to, to, to go forward on those two tracks in a way that, that resets it. And then I think a lot of the humanitarian stuff, frankly, once the security is better, once there is a functional government starts to to get to get better itself, but in the meantime, you at least have the means to deliver uh, on security. And again, the one thing I would insist on through any of this is to make sure that at the end of it, there is a capable Haitian government standing and delivering, and not just another, you know, army of NGOs that are doing all this through the private sector in a way that is not sustainable. The, the Haitian government has got to be supported in a way that it never has been before, and insist. The international community needs to insist that that's where the emphasis goes and that's the institutions that are built. Yeah. Thank you very much. Louis Henry? Thank you, Keith. Comment? Yes, uh, there are uh, plans uh, uh, that have been uh, prepared. The uh, national police has a strategic plan. The uh, uh, disarmament commission has a strategic plan for disarmament. Uh, those plans need to be uh, assessed and built on, and uh, the national the national police. The issue in the neighborhoods is the fact that the national police, the justice system, the state is totally absent from the neighborhoods. That has to be taken into consideration when you when you take out the gangs. Are you prepared to bring in the police presence and the justice and the uh, infrastructure? that is needed to, to, to be in those neighborhoods. If not, the void is gonna be filled by more gangs. So uh, there, there are plans that are, that are available, but it has to be a holistic approach. It cannot be only a security approach. It has to be uh, an economic, it has to be a structural, it has to be a holistic approach to the uh, Haitian situation. And we have to make sure, like Keith said, that it's a free and fair election, that the Haitian people have the opportunity to really choose who they want to lead them. As long as the neighborhoods are under the control of the armed groups, that is not going to happen. And as long as the government in place <clears throat> not totally sincere about transforming this situation, it's not going to happen. I hope they are. I would like to thank um, both of you, our panelists, for your thoughts today and for participating in this conversation. Um, uh, I've learned a lot. I would also like to thank our viewing audience for, uh, uh, for joining us. Um, I, I note that we still have um, uh, nearly 60 people with us. Um, uh, to those who have uh, joined us, if you have um, uh, questions that were not addressed by um, any of us during the program that you would like us to revisit, um, uh, please get in touch with us through the uh, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. 
I wish you all a very good afternoon. Thank you again. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you.